Ready, set, go! <laughs> Welcome to Risky Talking. I am very excited because I'm surrounded and we are with some of the most extraordinary makers, creators, releasers, some of the most generous geniuses around. We're going to be talking about creating space that allows creativity and risk and change, about generosity, about ambition, about vulnerability, risk, and we're going to be hearing from you. I'm serious about your riskiest thought. I want you to write that on that bit of paper. Part of the motivation of this series was to talk about how would politics, how would development, how would real estate, how would our lives be different if artists were at the table, if creative thinkers were at the table. Um, so I'm going to try you, Majora. How do we create spaces where creativity can happen? How do you do this unlocking potential? It's a collaborative process. And you have to be very open to strange bedfellows. And usually, the stranger, the better. Um, because you realize, you know, especially in, in my line of work, you really can't get a whole lot of things done unless you're you know, working across the aisle, playing with a lot of different with folks. So give us an example. In business or in, um, you, know, you need to know finances. You also need to understand how community functions. You also need to know government. I mean, there are just different ways, and, and they all respond to very different stimuli. We're really trying to disrupt how real estate development is done in, in poor communities right now. And um, you know, our, we think that affordable housing concentrates poverty and all the ills associated with it, which we know is going to go over really big you know, with a lot of affordable housing advocates. But I have not seen anything over the past years that I've worked in, um, or places that I've worked in, where that kind of Band-Aid approach to poor communities does anything except continues to make them poor. And so how do we create opportunities for economic diversity that support people to move up and out of poverty and retain you know, the, the one's bright flight you know, in those communities? Many people are taught to measure success by how far they leave those communities. And we are trying to create, orchestrate a strategy that <laughs> recognizes the power and the talent that's in those communities, culturally, socially, um, and create new forms economically to support that. Um, and so our investors are really excited. Um, and you know, we're, we know there's going to be no small amount of, um, of drama that's associated with it, but I'm really excited about having a very practical approach to supporting people. and helping them see that their lives are of value. So before everyone says, she's against affordable housing, um, I don't care. what do you mean? I'm trying to harness the power of gentrification. Why is it that we save the best of development only for, for folks you know, of a certain class, it's not even poor white, so sorry, um, you know, who of a certain class of folks? I know that there are great possibilities you know, poor people like living in nice places too. And if we can look before, because look, everybody knew Williamsburg was going to happen years ago. But was there anybody saying, how do we create models here that reduce displacement, that prepare people to participate in the economic booms that are coming here, that secure their rights for them to, to either keep and retain some of the real estate here so that they benefit from it? I want to see that kind of mod the, the kind of model that we are pushing um, happening around the country, you know, starting in my own community in the South Bronx. But the whole point is, is that I don't think it's that hard. The same way that we use real estate development to concentrate part, uh, poverty, we can also use it to reduce its impact. We really can do that through a very strategic mix of economic development and housing. So instead and of Red lining, you'd have like rainbow lining. Yeah, like why can't we build like 
quote unquote affordable housing, you know, in some of the wealthier communities and do it in a very, in a cool way where it's nice and it doesn't look ghettoized and stupid. Um, or, you know, why can't we set up the kind of things that middle class people would like in poor communities to make it so that they'd want to stay? So that guess what? Everybody benefits. It's Look, possible. Listen. Well, I'm so curious about that because I, I get asked a lot. You know, we came in here at the cusp of the gentrification. I, I didn't think it was already happening. We came in here in, in 03. And um, trying to figure out how do you make this public and how do you, I mean, we're working with Snowheda, Ann Lewison is right up there, our architect at Snowheda. We're trying to figure out how do you alter the facade of the building so that the every person would stop and it would evoke utter curiosity and wonder first, yeah. not, oh, that's glass and steel and yeah. brick and I can't go in there. Uh -huh. what, are the, what are the coded metaphors, mm -hmm. what are the coded um, messages coded. That, are, that are out there loud yeah. and people walk, most people walk by? It's the class thing. Yeah. Look. It's the class thing that I don't have any idea what right. to do about. I'm a coded oh. message. You're a coded message? In my own neighborhood. How, how do you do that? Um, I'm considered successful. And so if they don't see me leaving my house, they'll, and if they haven't seen me in a little while, they'll say things like, oh, Majora, where, 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 do, you live? where do you live now? With the subtext being like, you can't possibly live here because you're successful, and thus successful people do not live in communities like this. And that kills me more than anything because it's not a reflection on me. It's a reflection on how they see themselves. And that's what, is so painful about knowing what I know and, and having been the places that I've been um, around this country, um, you know, where you've got where low income people of all colors, and it's not just the black or brown thing, it really is not, see themselves as truly less than because they happen to have been born in a so in a certain socioeconomic status. I mean, it's very hard to shake that, you know, that shame and that embarrassment of being working class, being mm -hmm. below, working poor. I mean, Bill, how do you, how do you, like, would you say Nyla is gentrified or would you say that it represents the Chelsea community or the <laughs> downtown <laughs> dance community? I did not want to be in Chelsea. Mm. I mean, I love it. Guys are good looking, you know, in yeah. shots and so on. But no, I thought, you know, you're going to do, I mean, this is where Ernie and I cut our teeth there, but that neighborhood, when I saw what it was, I mean, they, there's no, they don't need contemporary dance. And to this day, there are people who live in the neighborhood who say, oh, you know, we don't, we don't really go there because we feel it's like a, a closed, it's a closed shop. It's like for insiders, huh. you know? So gentrification, there are, multi-millionaires throughout that neighborhood and there is this kind of scrappy sense of it being an artist run space that almost feels like anachronism from another time mm -hmm. so who is your community mm -hmm. you know and how do you get the people from your community and other places to actually buy into coming there making work there seeing work there that's what we're working at right now. Mm. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's a different thing. It's not coincidence that we, a conversation crossing the worlds of arts and politics ends up talking about development. Yeah. Because for a lot of people, it's only at that nexus mm. that they grapple with the arts, that they mm. meet the artists. Oh, they're coming in, bang goes the neighborhood. <laughs> or, oh, they're coming in, yay, the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, this sounds like a ridiculous question, but is that a problem? <laughs> Is that worse than it used to be? Where are the other nexus points where art and politics interact or could in a useful way? Well, I, I was thinking that the, the, the taint on the money and the origin of the money, like Bill, you're saying you get some from the city and from developers, or perhaps if it's a cultural institution, Department of Cultural Affairs could give you some money. But the thing is when you get, let's say half your building, let's say your building costs 50, $57 million and you get $35 million from the city, mm -hmm. that's taxpayers' money. Like I feel that it's incumbent on those, the people who run those spaces, um, and I feel it's incumbent on us, um, likewise, to make them public. Yeah. And the only time in my estimation that they are public is when people spend $25 or $100 for a ticket. That's not public, that's called the mercantile exchange. So how do we 
start to behave differently, to defamiliarize the behavior of theater goers, so that we are really operating as we should, I think, as public parks, or what, are we a church or are we a 7-Eleven? And you know, mm -hmm. figuring out what, the, what a new structure might is be. Is it possible to be running all these organizations and dealing with all this real estate and worrying about all of this and still take risks? Uh, well, I, I mean, again, I think it's about the size. I mean, that's been my estimation at this point, that if it's a, the right sizedness and your overhead isn't going to cripple you, right. um, and, and let's say, let's say, you know, our budget was, oh, I'll just say my budget was something like $680,000 10 years ago, and now it's something like $2.7 million, but we built earned income, we built, we're still philanthropically, you know, um, dependent and all that. But we have all of these vectors of earned income and all these different use groups that come in here. Well, circus, kids, and strip. That's, those are the use groups I chose. So I still think that, I still think that there's a responsibility, a civic duty to, um, to really respect the origin of that money and where it comes from, the origin of it, and um, behave, behave differently, I guess, to change our, our, our habits of behavior and see. I mean, how would that happen in development? Like, for instance, would you mix up? I never think rich people want to live with poor people. I mean, I don't know if they call about affordable housing, and I wonder if they actually exercise that. So many nasty things that could be said. Yeah. Like what I knew a Canadian <laughs> diplomat who used to tell me, he was a gay man who was closeted, married, and he used to say, you know, New York is the best value because there are enough poor people, and they, and they really, you know, if you're into cruising, if you're into sex, mm. you want to hang out with the poor. Mm. Why? Why would you want to hang out with the poor if you're into sex? I don't know. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Am I missing something here? No, I'm just not in that world. I, yeah, know. good. I know, I know. But I'm saying that. I mean, I That's don't. why I'm saying it's a nasty thing to say, which I don't know yeah. if, it, if you people. But there is, you talk about the relationship of the rich to the poor. Yeah. Uh, the poor are where one. the poor are where the funk is, where the, the, the fun is. You know, the poor is where you can go play. Because they have nothing to lose. Is that what's happening? Well, they have plenty to lose, but they also are hungry. Exactly. You, you know, it's you, the you, know what, you know what sex tourism is? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that, the conversation that, uh, that Jolon Vieira was telling us about with his middle class friends in uh, Bahia, uh, in Salvador, because he, he, he's working with kids in the street in mm -hmm. Capoeira. And he said, you know, you, 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 you're messing with our, our hunting grounds, man. You know, uh, you know, because there's lots of poor people in the street. And now we're talking another kind of poor poverty. I don't know, you probably know mm -hmm. better than I do. You think about the poorest of the poor in Salvador de Bahia, mm -hmm. and you think about the Bronx. And, he was, and there are middle class Brazilians. They happen to be gay men. Right. And that's what the, the, the order is. Those people are there for us to, right. to, to, to use. Right. To, you know, I don't know, you, you pay them, you whatever, you know. $200, let me piss on you, you know, or, uh, you know, no, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about right, I, 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 I'm going to pull us back for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> One thing I want to know, have you written your riskiest thought on the piece of paper? Maybe you want to take it back and write something else now. Mm -hmm. But um, have, have those papers been being collected? <laughs> no. Could, you collect, could we send out our lovely uh, ushers to collect them, pass the collection plates, create a, an atmosphere of mm -hmm. liturgy and religion? Yeah, but, but, but let me just... No, but is, it, is that risky talking? What happened? Absolutely what happened just talking. there? Well, we connected uh, money and sex. Yeah, yeah. Money, sex, power, and race. And, and, yeah, and that's risky, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In a room full of well meaning liberal people. Right. Right? Yeah. Anyone want to pick up on this? Because we're, we're at a crux of the yeah. conversation, and we're at a crux in our society where we have increasing disparity, right. increasing potential for the kind of relationships you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You have massive transformation in our city with now black flight from here, not mm -hmm. for necessarily good reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have an economy that if we do not figure out how to develop more equitably, mm -hmm. we're going no place. And does America still think it's white? That's what we used to, a friend of mine said, America's tragedy is that it, it's passing for white. As of this <laughs> moment, the majority of newborns are people of color. Right. As of this moment already. Now let's right. make sure we adjust our conversation here tonight right. to talk to the reality of the demographic shift. But we passed that in 2011 here. Like the, new, the 23 county region in New York, like it's no longer majority white. 
So we yeah, are always yeah, now, yeah. We, well, I think we're using race in a very lax way because we're actually talking about class, aren't Absolutely. we? That, you mm -hmm. know? And that's a, you scarier, that's a scarier discussion. Real poverty, whether it's in Bahia, whether it's in you know, Baghdad or the Bronx, I don't really care where it is. I mean, what it does is destroy your ability to feel as though you have the capacity to contribute to anything. Mm. And that is the true shame of what it does. And so developing new ways to just, I mean, I don't think that most of the things that we're gonna be doing with that model is going to make everybody a, a millionaire. I don't, but I do think that it's gonna give them opportunities to be paid a living wage and be able to pay their own way. And that, I think, is something that is not afforded to a lot of folks out there. And, and it has an impact on them, on the communities they live in, on their kids, on the people that are around them. And like when you can't, when you don't feel as though you have, you can afford to be generous, you become really tight. And there's just no giving that's allowed, that, that you feel as though you can afford to do. And Although in terms of who actually gives what, poor people give more than rich people. Yeah. How do you mean give? A lot in the oh, church. Well, I'm thinking of actual giving of what they yeah. earn and have to causes, to charities, to church, to community, to each other. I thought you meant other. that in terms, let's say, in the world of fashion, oh, there please. is an engine well, in the lower classes, uh -huh. an mm -hmm. engine of innovation right. and risk and mm -hmm. daring, that too. bad taste that percolates up, yeah. and then somebody plucks it, yep. That's why it's such a merchandises cool. it, and um, then sells it back. And then it comes up again, and again, and again, and again. Can you that's say hip-hop? Like, but can you say hip-hop? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, that's I mean, why you can't have development and growth and an economy that functions without diversity. Right, exactly. Diversity drives, innovation. among other things, innovation, mm -hmm. new markets, yep. you name it. If you, you need to put it in those terms, it's in those terms. But Laura, do you think that's what I just said, though? I think that, quite frankly, and this is a very cynical thing I'm about to say, the pressure cooker is actually good for for. Because I'm saying, you keep that pressure cooker uh -huh. down here, and it keeps generating, and it bubbles up, and you pluck it off, and you sell it back there. You have to keep that down. You have to. You need an underclass. Do you, you really uh -huh. think you need well, an underclass? I'm being, I'm being somewhat cynical, but that's the way the model has as worked it, as it, in the as West. As it works right now, not the way that it always has to work. Okay, because you're the visionary that has an idea of what it can be different, how right. it can be different. Exactly, because, yeah. mm -hmm. because you're absolutely right. Like we're, you know, the whole extractive nature of, of everything that's good in our community is taken out and someone else benefits from it, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the folks mm -hmm. who are already there. And again, that goes, and that's across color lines. I mean, if you think about coal country, mm. very white people. Um, most of the ones who live there do not benefit from that at all. They're like huge companies that do so, and, oh, we and do. it doesn't go back. Huh? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the companies that own the coal, as opposed to the people that are either at one point work the mines and now just unfortunately live in a toxic brew. But um, the the real core of it is how do we like do we trust communi those communities enough to believe that they have the capacity to be the keys to their own recovery? You know, poor folks. And in particular, like in, in poor urban communities, a less than a third of the people under 50 have bank accounts. Two thirds of the people under 50 have smartphones. So we're huge consumers of technology, not big producers of it. How do we flip that dynamic so that the folks in communities like ours are actually starting to create the next big thing that is going to not just create an app you know, for, because most apps right now are made for people whose lives are already pretty cool. But imagine if there was a whole slew of people mm. around the world that were trying their hardest to create had, and had the skills to use technology to figure out how do we use technology to actually make mm. life better for, other, for, the, for the rest of us. That would be crazy. That would be taking that beautiful pressure cooker thingy and, and, and channeling it so that it circulates right back. Mm. That's what's cool. Uh, yes, was well, I was just thinking about one, there's a problem with education, but separate oh, from that, you little. know, to make the next great widget, you really, you need some great education mm -hmm. system, which clearly this country doesn't have. But I was thinking too of just when we're artists, let's say, I think everyone is an artist because you're inventing things all the time, but then you're making, you're trying to make a language that the every person can comprehend. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and we are fighting, I fight, to try and figure out, hey, I'm not feeding people, I'm not housing them. How could I possibly be spending all this time 
putting on shows. Like, I must rationalize that somehow. But if I could create a language that ends up being so archetypal, let's say for those who labor, for those who basically, you know, get in accidents, for those people who really, um, you know, uh, uh, don't need to be told a story but want to have an experience. Like, I start to think about what is the permeability of a uh, vocabulary that would speak to the every person. My adopted sister is a member of the working poor in, in, in Michigan, and she came to see us once for the first time, maybe 10 years ago in Chicago, and, I, and we were doing two shows, and she'd never ever seen my work before. And then the next, she had another chance to see it the next day, and she went shopping. Or she didn't come to the theater, and, all, and I didn't realize till years later she was embarrassed. Mm. People in the theater made her feel bad. How, because, how so? Because she didn't know how to dress, she probably smelled differently. She um, didn't know how to behave. And, mm. and, and, and my big tortured trauma is I believe that any theater in this country, and probably even this one, um, does not, the, 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 the underclass would not go to those places. Mm -hmm. And they're not designed to make them feel <clears throat> comfortable or even to Do present a message they care about. Uh, I, was, I was just thinking about my, um, the thing I don't know how to talk about is Broadway. Because I don't know, where are the people? Where are the people, you know? How do I build a bridge between what we're doing at New York Live Arts? And there's a lot of beautiful, wonderful work going on there. How do I build a bridge with that community where we know the tickets are, you know, maybe if you stand in line, you can get something for $75. And 150 is more like the average. And then if you're going to Book of Mormons, it's for what, peak tickets, 430 wow. or something like that. Now, Broadway used to be the people's theater. Yeah. It used to be where a middle class family from New Jersey or Queens would go out and have a meal and go see a Broadway show. But now it's becoming, and I don't know, there's, it's beyond me, but it's becoming really, really impossible um, to, to, for people who invest the money to make any money back so they become more and more conservative. People are risk averse and they don't want to pay a lot of money. It's a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, what do you mean you want to build a bridge between the downtown community where everyone is holding on with their fingernails? And is there somebody there who, who has an idea that can hit up, that can make somebody themselves mm -hmm. and somebody uptown mm -hmm. a, a lot of money? Where is the investment coming from? Um, the, and so this is, this yeah. is in, in a way, and how do you get the people into that audience that you want to be there? I'm kind of um, just stuck on Broadway at one point being the people's theater. What? Considering, but yeah, my whole frame of reference is not being able to see much of anything for mm -hmm. very long. Okay, sorry. I don't <laughs> but what do you mean, you don't think it really was? No, I'm just, I'm, no, of course I think it was. Mm -hmm. just yeah. so you would know, but um, mm -hmm. I just can't, just where it is right now. Like, yeah. I'm like, really? That was the case, huh? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Like a lot of things in America, don't yeah, you think? Yeah, I, I shouldn't be surprised. It, you know, so America's made, people, let's make it up. Yeah. Let's, let's make this, make this form. But that know? speaks, in answer, in a sense, to your point about the pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll say, you know, my risky thought right now, I thought it was going to be about cynicism, where you mm -hmm. began. Now I feel it's about idealism, mm -hmm. that I am risky enough to believe that actually if we met more of each other, we would like each other more. Yeah. That's mm. sort of the theory of media. So who is the we in that sense? We as a society, we as a people. Can we really take that people. kind of bite though, Laura? Well, I I'm saying, so it's risky for me to say mm -hmm. I believe in something because you're right, it's not as simple as all this. No, I mean, really, it, it, it's I really so hard excited. for me to feel part of any mass we right now, other than the we that is born, grows, and will certainly die. Now, other than that, that's a pretty big we. That and that is the only we I understand really, right? I don't know if the soul exists. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything. Everything else is faith and belief. And do we want to talk about the risk of having faith? Oh, no faith. Well, you said idealism. Idealism is a kind of a religion, right? It's a, it, you have to buy into it. There's no guarantee what's right. going to happen, but you've got to buy into it. You've right. got to give yourself to it, and. I don't know, Mr. Ms. Live Action over here. What about <laughs> idealism when you don't well, know, I, the, the, you know, when you just don't know? So let's say idealism. You're alive, right? There's no reason to believe in anything after. But I figure, well, I'm going to believe in a higher power. 
Because, you know, okay, so here's one scenario. I believe in a higher power. It makes me happier. I have faith. So I always say, could you help me? And I get helped. And it seems to work out okay to stay optimistic. And then let's say I, the optimist or the idealist, I die. And it's not true. Well, who cares? I'm dead, you know. But the other person, the other person who doesn't believe in God and argues with everybody who does, and not God, but any higher power, whatever you want to call it, spirit world. Yeah. And then they die and they realize, oh, no. I was wrong, you know, then it's really too late, you know. <laughs> that would be a risk. <laughs> so, right? <laughs> I, I think we've gone through property, we've class, been to heaven and hell. race, <laughs> sex, development. How does change happen? How do, we, how do economic, economies move forward? Now we're on to God. Well, right. I, but, you know, I, I wasn't going to God. I, idealism is a type of religion. And it doesn't have nothing to do with God. It's got to be. We haven't got enough fact to really motivate us. Yeah. To, 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 it's you know, it's not. Uh, it it's not justified it's belief. Faith. It's just right. belief. Well, what's that postcard? Oh, um, that's postcard. Not true. It is justified belief. We are in a better place as society. History has progressed. I do believe so. <laughs> I am. I do believe this country. Even if you just want to talk about the United States, mm. has progressed from completely hypocritical ideals mm -hmm. to a slightly Disorder. closer embrace. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I got you. I'm because of you. people's yeah. movements, because of mobilization, not by the weather or God or chance, although maybe all that helped, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but organizing, thinking, So when the five-year-old walks to, up to you and says, you know, what is the meaning of this? Well, that's another question. I mean, that's where I take it to. Like you're talking about someone can walk in and see it in, in action. I mean, what do you say to them, boom, you know, this is what it is. Well, did the Buddhists say, life is suffering, right? That's what I heard, uh, Yong Chin Lamo told me, that's what you say to a child, life is suffering. Well, or you, know? you And then if you attach to life, you will suffer. Therefore, you've got to look past life. Mm -hmm. Now, that is her belief. What are we saying with the real religion of idealism? What are you saying to that person who wants to know, give me the deal? Well, I, don't, I mean, don't you think that what's that postcard, a guy playing the saxophone, and it says, sometimes you have to believe in something before you can see it. And that's just magical thinking in a certain way. Mm. Yes. So well, you have the story about the, the um, running of the four-minute mile. Yeah, you know, but... For many, many years, people thought it actually would kill you. <laughs> and then as soon as 1954 comes along and somebody shaves that second off the, 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 the four-minute mile... Six-tenths of a second. Those six-tenths of a second? <laughs> then that record continues to be broken over and over again in the following years right. because people yeah. saw that it could be done. Yeah, that was in 1954. Um, and then in, by 1966, they shaved 16 seconds off of the four-minute mile. And, and they told Chuck Yeager he wouldn't be able to break the speed of sound because the physicist said that his, his machine would, be, would, be, would burst into dust. And he intuitively didn't believe that, and hey. Mm -hmm. So maybe we don't need the pressure cooker of misery. Oh, you know what? I, my faith is that we do not. And there are people who I have faith in who are doing it. My question tonight is, do I have the stuff to keep the faith? That's, that's the honest deal. Then why do, you, why do you think you don't? Because I live in here. And you live out here, too. Yeah. Uh, are you sure? Positive. Yes, we're all sure. We've seen yeah. you. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. There's a dream in the forest. It's dark. There is a thing, a monster. I'm hiding. He's looking. In any moment, he's going to find out I'm there. Start walking. Start walking. Start running. He's running. Start flying. Flying. He's flying. I'm flying high, 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 high. I can't, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. Boom, it falls. Since six, that dream, mm. right? Now I begin to understand what it means, right? What that is, you know, what, that's my confidence idea. Like, what is this falling? Yeah? So, yeah, I, I thank you for your faith. But you know, each one of us has got to solve that problem for mm -hmm. themselves. Mm. The creature behind you, right? When do you turn around and say, come on, motherfucker? Exactly. Yeah. Well, easy, yeah, yeah, easy to say. Uh, no, it's not easy to say, and it's not easy to do either, but you do it. 
That's well, what risk is. I mean, who am I talking to for the love of God? I mean, come on, bro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're just trying to talk real, my sister. That's, I hear it. Okay, because I think, I think in a symposium like this, the tendency is for us to, to actually speak as if we're of one mind and there's a lot of rant. You oh. know? Not can't, I'm sorry. And I think that we, as, as progressive people, have got to be cutting that shit down all the time. And it, sometimes it looks like negativism. That, can you look at it right now? Can you look it in the mouth, right? That's all I'm doing here tonight. I'm only speaking as a private citizen, not Filthy Jones the icon, right? Mm -hmm. This is the man who is real time speaking. That, when I'm talking to young folks, they got to see that real man is there, uh -huh. and yet he gets out of bed every day, mm -hmm. and he shows up. But, but, but that's what, I, go ahead. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that is the challenge. That you, you know, that, that dream you have, that fear you have, the fear that we all have, mm -hmm. that we can't, that we won't measure up, that you know we're going to look in, in the mirror and that person's going to be laughing at you, all that crap. Mm -hmm. Believe me. And you do what you do, in spite of all that. Mm -hmm. And that's what's I think the difference between folks who will, will step up and take those risks, and you know we'll have the scars in our neck from folks trying to cut it off, and you still dag on get up and do it. Um, that's the hard part. I'm, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm afraid almost all the time. Mm -hmm. But but it doesn't stop you. No. And that's a discipline, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Me too. You too. Yes. Can we invite them in? Why not? Yeah. Do we have agreement. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Do we have we the plates? We need to conduct our um, risky talk <coughs> ritual release. Yeah. Okay. But where are the plates? They're coming to us. I have faith. Oh, this I even have this justified belief. <laughs> So, so this is the idea that, can I say what, yeah, yeah. what happens is that we are now going to join your risky notions, statements, questions to the particle physics universe and release them. So by the time you wake up tomorrow morning, uh, you wanna you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to do yeah, it. Yeah. Just, 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 you, know, you just hold it. You're part oh. of it. You add your little energy here. Oh, I see. I'm not energy. picking anything. No, no, no oh. picking. Do you want to just hold it? Okay, good. good. No. Just while well, we're just being ritualistic. <laughs> That's all you have to do. And once your risky thoughts have been released, you get to ask questions and participate in the conversation, so get ready. All right, I'll do what you say. Are you ready? Let's stand here. Are you ready? Audience? Get it. Anytime, guys. I feel released. <laughs> so wait. So <laughs> those are your those are your those are your risky talks. Your so, risky thoughts. So so this we're not is releasing into the <laughs> dust. <laughs> yeah, you can go over there and pick one out. <laughs> so wait. So what are we telling the audience that you kind of have a risky thought and it gets crushed by no, all no. <laughs> We're saying we're saying look at the dust. Majora, the yeah. release into the atmosphere oh. of your risky thoughts. I see. I knew somebody was going to say it's that. It's the dust. <laughs> but we decided to risk it anyway. This is my question. So All right, who has a question? I knew someone was going to say that. It was the I'm risk sorry. we ran. There's a hand over there. Okay, hand over there. I, I really wanted to ask you, uh, and after hearing you speak, uh, how dare you, how dare you, uh, be able to achieve uh, what you have achieved. And, and, uh, and that is uh, one of the things that I, 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 sh I try to figure out in my daily life and work and love and play mm. is how to do it. And you guys have done it and, uh, to, to uh, a certain extent and, uh, and a great extent. Doing it. And I think a lot of people would like to know just how, what is your motivation? I wasn't kidding when I said that I'm fearful most of the time. I wasn't kidding. Um, you know, I know I walk into a room and I've got this history, you know, that, that you know, crossed with me from the, from the middle passage um, that was here, you know, with all my ancestors before I got here. Mm. And so, yeah, so the question is how dare I rings really true to me, it's just, it is a really big one. And then mm -hmm. I ask myself, well, if not me, 
I mean, why not me? Why not me?